Good morning and a very, very warm welcome to each and every one of you here this morning. It's good to see such a substantial number of people back with us today. And welcome to those who will be watching this service later or listening to it later. From Psalm 105, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. And so we continue our worship with the hymn, Praise to the Holiest in the Height, 562 in Baptist Praise and Worship. Let us continue to worship God as we come together in prayer. O oh Lord, we come before you this morning. We want to join countless others around the world in giving thanks to you today. To make known your deeds, not just to each other, but to others too. We come to sing our praises to you and so to tell of all your wonderful works. We proclaim your greatness and your power. We also this morning, Lord, acknowledge that you are a holy God. We have come to praise you, the holiest in the height. But we recognise that you who are holy 
came in Jesus to be lowly. He humbled himself and came amongst us. And as we have sung and proclaimed already, he gave himself for us. But we go on to recognise too that he overcame death and the grave and we proclaim him a risen Lord Christ. This morning we pray that together we will indeed give thanks to you for whom you are and for all that you have done. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will enable us thus to do. We pray too that we will be willing to receive from your word. And as we hear that word later, that we will respond to it as you call us to do. And we thank you for the opportunity that is provided today to gather in the way that Jesus asked that his followers would do, to remember and to proclaim him. And so we give you our grateful thanks in Jesus' name. He who, when on earth, taught us to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. We have two readings. Uh, the second will be a little bit later, but the first is coming now. Thank you, Mary. I'm reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, starting at verse 40. Jesus has just done a couple of healing miracles. As the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various kinds of diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on each of them and cured them. Demons also came out of many, shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Messiah. At daybreak he departed and went into a deserted place, and the crowds were looking for him, and when they reached him, they wanted to prevent him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he continued proclaiming the message in the synagogues of Judea. And so we're going to uh, sing again, and this time uh, the song... I, the Lord of sea and sky, uh, here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord, uh, and we'll rise to sing.
And so now we will have our second reading, uh, which is going to be brought to us by Brian. And the uh, second reading is from the book of Acts, uh, chapter 15, uh, verses 36, right through to chapter 16, verse 10. Uh, Paul and Barnabas separate. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, come, let us return and visit the believers in every city where we have proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark, but Paul decided not to take with them one who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not accompanied them in the work. The disagreement became so sharp that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and set out, the believers commending him to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. In chapter 16. Paul went on also to Derbe, and to Lystra, where there was a disciple whose name was Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of uh, by the uh, believers in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to take Simoth uh, Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and had him circumcised because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went from town to town, they delivered uh, uh, to them for ob observance the decisions which had been reached by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in numbers daily. Then they went through the region of uh, Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they had come opposite Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man from uh, Macedonia pleading with him, saying, Come over to Ma uh, Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Ma Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. Over recent years, several examples come to my mind very easily of experiences which were unexpected, and indeed some of them were unwelcome. And uh, the, the slides that you have, uh, yeah, the next couple of slides will illustrate those. You may be able to work them out more easily, some than others. Uh, you uh, will remember some of you, in fact most of you will remember the blast from the east, or technically blast from the east, because uh, they, were, they occurred twice during March 2018. And a few of you with brilliant memories will know that they had uh, a considerable impact on me personally because my view preach date here was changed three times during the early part of 2018 as a result of the blast from the east. Eventually, the address that had been prepared really needed to change because Easter had come and gone in the meantime as well. And then, of course, 
as the picture on the right illustrates, and you can ask me later more about that if you want. COVID-19's arrival was unwelcome to us all. And it is 18 months ago, nearly, that we knew it was coming our way and we have endured it and continue. It was not possible for us to have family or friends indoors for a good number of weeks during that first lockdown. The effects materially and emotionally, as well as physically, continue for very many people right across the world, uh, indeed disastrously in many parts of the world. And then, uh, personally, uh, the picture on the left may be uh, will remind one or two of you that the last time I was due to preach in this building, I was in isolation after having received, as many people did, a ping on my mobile phone. Thanks to technology and the wonderful work of Simon and Patsy, I was able to preach from home. But this was distinctly unwelcome news, and uh, uh, I imagine it was hugely unwelcome to Simon and Patsy, although their graciousness over it was amazing. And then, of course, uh, go back a week or two before that, uh, in the spring, we as a church learned that change in the church's ministry pattern here was becoming inevitable, as Simon had been called to a new part-time role in the university. This was unexpected, and for very many people, I guess it was unwelcome and uncomfortable. I will be quite honest, it certainly was for me on the day that I heard it. But the last three years, of course, are not the, the total picture. And of course, if we think about it, Jesus himself experienced over and over again what we might call the unexpected when he was on earth. The short passage that we heard from Luke chapter 4 tells us how Jesus was taking much needed, very short time out, going to what is described as a deserted place. Mark's Gospel tells us that it was an occasion that Jesus used to spend time in prayer. Luke tells us that, first of all, the people came looking for him, and then that they tried to prevent him from leaving. His time alone was interrupted. This must have been, from a human point of view, unwelcome. And there was clamour for him to change his plans, which he did not do. That's most certainly not the only occasion where this happened in Jesus' ministry. Our reading from the Acts of the Apostles highlights very clearly how the early church had to face and deal with the unexpected, which seemed unwelcome and indeed uncomfortable. At the end of chapter 15, we find one of the less happy episodes in the history of the early church. The issue was whether John Mark, who had failed in an earlier phase of the work, go back a couple of chapters, you can see what that probably was, whether John Mark should accompany Paul and Barnabas, who was also Mark's cousin, on a return visit to recently planted churches. It is possible that Paul and Barnabas were already in a degree of tension, as a short passage in the middle of Galatians 2 might allude to. But whatever the reason, Paul felt it extremely unwise to take Mark with him. The disagreement is described by Luke 
as sharp, and many modern translations use that word. There was no reconciliation. Barnabas took Mark and went to Cyprus, home territory, while Paul and his new companion Silas planned to go back, planned to go back to the young churches. But that plan changed significantly as the later part of the reading showed us. I wonder whose side would you have been on, Paul or Barnabas? I think I would have sided with Barnabas, who wanted Mark to have a second chance. But whether you would have sided with Paul or Barnabas, there was a distinctly unwelcome and end, uh, unwelcome end to a fruitful partnership. And then in chapter 16, the unexpected and unwelcome development is a very different one. Here, the door is firmly shut on Paul and Silas's hopes and expectations of the direction of travel. The direction that they had hoped or expected to travel was blocked twice. But this time, the reason is given as the Spirit of God. Commentators speculate upon how this was given. But the point is that the barriers were believed to be God's work. Instead of going in a southwest or northerly direction, as would have been likely, they ended up going northwest instead. Yet, yet, in these unexpected and in part unwelcome changes. God was working his purposes out for good and developing his servants and churches for future work. And I'd suggest to you that there are four ways that this is shown here. First of all, the church became involved in commending Paul and Silas, as in verse 40 of chapter 15. There was clear backing for this new phase of work by the believers, as they were described. They went, in other words, Paul and Silas went with the blessing of the Christian community. But secondly, two teams went out instead of one. Silas was in some ways an excellent replacement for Barnabas, having been accredited by the Jerusalem Council a little earlier in chapter 15, to send their judgments to Gentile believers. But very significantly, it's very likely that Mark came good later because Paul commends him, and it is believed this is the same Mark in Colossians 4. So eventually, the work of mission was enhanced by what appeared to be something quite awful. And then thirdly, Timothy appears in the scene. A young believer seemed to have great promise. He was already well spoken of, something which became a hallmark in the early church. He'd also made progress as a disciple. And so he is now invited to join the team. Later, in verse 10 of chapter 16, there is a hint with the word we appearing in the last verse that Brian read to us, uh, that Luke also joined the team. This vision and flexibility is a really significant mark in these verses. And then fourthly, the spiritual discernment shown by Paul and Silas and possibly Timothy and Luke to a degree, leads to a change in direction and significant results. The narrative continues with the arrival in Philippi, the conversion of Lydia, the first known convert in Europe. Beyond that, it continues with significant testing, but significant breakthroughs, and the arrival in Athens in chapter 17. Paul and Silas are said 
uh, in, in verses elsewhere here in the middle of Acts to have prophetic groups and prophetic gifts. And these are used to bring many to faith and to strengthen the church. Right now, we are facing the unexpected. This is the final Sunday, in a sense, before the transition takes place formally. In faith, the church membership has embraced a significant change in the way in which the staff team, to try to coin a phrase, will work together in ministry. But particularly in any church which believes in the priesthood of all believers, the changes that we face are ones which impact on us all. How can we all face the unexpected? How can we all work in the new normal? That was a phrase that was used, you will remember, in terms of COVID, but we're not using it in that respect here. How can we all strive to be the kind of church in which the love of Jesus is demonstrated and proclaimed? I suggest to you there are three ways, in particular, which these verses hint at too. First of all, we need to be a church which listens together. Above all, as we see in the early church, this means listening to the Spirit of God. Sometimes he will speak to us personally and directly. Sometimes, often, God speaks as we listen together. Sometimes this listening takes time. Sometimes as we listen to each other, we may sense that God is saying something unexpected or that we do not want to hear. Sometimes, however, we may simply need to wait, not to rush to impulsive decisions. And it is not just the role of appointed leaders to do this. As we saw in the verses in Acts, it is the responsibility of all God's people. Secondly, we need to be a church which identifies gifts together. The epistles in the New Testament do give considerable emphasis to this. And the total number of gifts mentioned is very considerable indeed and not exhaustive. I have to say that the Christian church tends to be often not good at identifying the gifts in people, nor sometimes very good in encouraging them. We are often much better at talking about them at the front than we are at getting them done in our midst. One of the joys that I have witnessed in the past three years has been the way in which a number of new people have been drawn into the church community, some of them with us this morning. Uh, indeed, some of them have been the keenest to return to face-to-face -face worship. It is becoming apparent that you are bringing new gifts among us, some of them to enhance worship, some of them to encourage others among us, some in sharing faith. It is the duty, indeed I would have to say it is the sacred responsibility of the Christian family in this church to use and develop these gifts. And then thirdly, we need and must be a church that works together the future of any church is dependent on God's blessing, as evidenced in the way in which we serve Jesus together. It is not a case of leaving it to others, nor is it a case of the appointed leaders of the church not involving others. Just as the pandemic taught us the necessity to support each other, and you know that I believe that as a church fellowship, we really did do that. So in this new period in the church's life, it is essential that we work 
actively in worship, in mission, in community. Working and serving together is proof of real love. The kind of love Jesus displayed and Jesus who came not to be served but to serve his own words in Mark 10. Did you notice, do you notice from the screen the word together appears in each of the points above? The very clear message for us is of the need to work together. The result of the events in these verses of Acts is described by one commentator that I looked at in this way. The Spirit did not frustrate Paul's strategy, but enhanced its effectiveness. The unexpected changes, unwelcome and uncomfortable as they may be, may be used by God to bring great blessing and real spiritual growth. Now a verse which I wondered about basing this address upon and didn't, a verse which has been used very unhelpfully by very many Christians over the years is Romans 8.28. Literally, as on the screen, the first part could be translated thus. And we know that to the ones loving God, all things work together God for good. It is not saying that everything will be instantly fine, that there's no real problem, that all will be well. It is saying that God can turn everything into something which is good if we allow him thus to do. Even the sharp, some may say sinful, disagreement between Paul and Barnabas was used by God. The frustrations on their journey into Europe were of God and used by God. As we approach a major change, which I guess we could not have anticipated a few months ago, the message from the early church, the Lord's message to us is twofold. First, it is that all of us, those whose roles are changing especially, but also those whose involvement is not, have an obligation to seek to work together. But secondly, the message is that together, as we as a body of Christ listen, develop and serve in this place, we can rest in his promise that he can work for the good of our life and witness as a church. Amen. And so I invite you, if you love the Lord Jesus, to join us uh, in this act of remembrance, in this communion service together. God has made us one people, we have been shaped by his will. Jesus calls us together and we meet in his name. The Spirit binds us together. He leads us into all truth. Here the Lord's table is spread as for a feast. Bread to be broken, wine poured out, symbols of his life given up for us, his blood poured out. But he is not dead, he is risen and present among us. Evidence of God's covenant, grace and promise 
And so we come in faith to the table, you and me. Some of us may be fresh and eager. Some may come weary in need of spiritual nourishment. All of us need to come conscious of our failings. And at this point, therefore, I give us a moment to reflect quietly on our need to acknowledge before God our failings, our wrongdoings. As we now come together in prayer, I invite you to join me in a response. When I say, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him, please respond, we will trust in him at all times. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. We will trust in him at all times. We come to pray. God, our Father, King of kings and Lord of lords, bigger than the whole world, but prepared in patience to create it and us for our benefit and enjoyment. Forgive us that we fail to recognise all that you have given and act responsibly. We are aware of our destructive instincts the damage we inflict and the problems we create for others who struggle to cope with the unexpected twists and turns of life. Father, in forgiving our failures, bigger than the whole world, you sent your son Jesus in love to restore our fellowship with you and start over. The task is great, but let us not be discouraged keeping our eyes upon Jesus. Encourage and envision us to create through his strength and power new ways of bettering this world now and in future. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. We will trust in him at all times. Our Father, as we acknowledge your Son as Lord over all, we bring to you those suffering pain and loss from many terrible happenings upon our streets and across the world, remembering its war-torn and disaster-ravaged nations, praying too for those seeking refuge from harm. Lord, as you share the tears, wrap your arms around each of your sorrowing, suffering children in their time of need. We bring to you the Afghan peoples, the Haitian peoples, the storm-stricken ones in several American states. And we give thanks for loving hearts, providing and offering help. Lord, through the presence of your Holy Spirit, grant the blessing of renewal as lives have to be rebuilt. In current times of deep hurt, difficult to understand, we recall Isaiah's words, He, God, gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. As we have heard of Paul's plans having to be adjusted under your spirit's guidance, we pray that where lives are now having to adapt to new situations, that same spirit of acceptance and renewal may lead them through. May the acceptance of your sacrificial love and grace fill tearful eyes with the powerful light of hope that rests in Jesus now and in the tomorrows that lie ahead. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. 
we will trust in him at all times. We remember before you this day the welcoming witness of our church family here at South Street and Bramford Speak, our visitors and in places far afield. We thank you for our ministers and ourselves adjusting to different patterns of working, adapting to change. Encourage us forwards, Lord. We thank you for the entire church family in supporting each other through these many months of testing and for the blessings received. We pray for the Palace Gate Centre, its dedicated staff, and today all its users, including the new groups using it. We pray your blessing and comforting companionship on those who are unwell, at home, in hospital or care homes, and those looking after them. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. We will trust in him at all times. We pray for our city and its surrounds, our MPs and councillors, those providing public services, those in retail working in the NHS and its different parts, the fire, police, ambulance and other emergency services, including our military services, all overcoming so many challenges on our behalf. We thank you for their continuing dedication and support, which too often goes silently unrecognised. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. We will trust him at all times. Lord, knowing you hear our prayers, we will trust in you at all times. And to you be glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Just before our concluding hymn, there are three things I do need to mention as notices. Uh, first of all, you uh, will have uh, picked up uh, from one or two things said earlier uh, that uh, next week is a special service. Uh, whether you describe it as induction, recommissioning or whatever, it is the moment at which uh, as a church we will seek together to move forward under the new pattern uh, that has been agreed uh, by the church with such a large uh, majority in favour. Uh, we do need to say to you that that service will go over the hour by a degree. Uh, with the amount that's going on, and uh, Mary will, I think, confirm that it's being very tightly scheduled, but nonetheless getting it within the hour uh, is just not going to be possible. So we do need to uh, advise you of that. Uh, and then thirdly, Dove Cafe resumes on Tuesday. Uh, Tuesdays only at the moment, there'll be more detail about a somewhat rejigged Thursday later, but it resumes on Tuesday with a little bit of adjustment that has to be made for ongoing uh, needs. But uh, we look forward to that and I know there are a large number of people beyond who are looking forward to that as well. Just before that last hymn, a very brief prayer giving God thanks for the giving of his people. Lord, although we are not presenting the offering uh, in front this morning, we acknowledge the generosity of your people and your goodness to this church uh, again at this time. And we pray that you will take all that has been given in different ways and use it to your glory in this place and well beyond it too. In Jesus' name, amen. Our final hymn is personal, but yet it is speaking to us all. Lord, speak to me, to us, that I, that we, may speak in living echoes of your tone.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.